Also come to order. <laughs> Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file, herewith transmitted. Senate file 671, signed Joanne M. Zoff, Secretary of the Senate. First reading Senate, uh, of Senate bills. Introduction and first reading of Senate File 671, an act relating to public safety. Paymar moves that Senate File 671, House File 724, now in the General Register, be referred to the Chief Clerk for comparison. Hearing no objection, so ordered. <laughs> Calendar for the day. First bill on the calendar for the day is House File 19. The clerk will report the bill. House File 19, number one on the calendar for the day. The second engrossment, an act relating to accounts. Representative Hortman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this bill was brought to me by the Minnesota State Bar Association. It's a fairly simple bill. It deals with having additional signers on your checking account. Very often, an elderly parent will add a child as a signer on their account. Under current law, that signer becomes a co-owner on the account, and upon the primary owner's death, um, others are excluded from ownership of the account. What House File 19 would do would be to allow a parent in that situation to make their child or other trusted person a signer, but not give them ownership rights of the checking account. I hope you'll support the bill. There's no known opposition. There's no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 19. Third reading. Any discussion of the bill? Seeing no discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 132 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 1086. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File 1086. Uh, on the calendar for the day, the first engrossment, an act relating to human rights. Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill was brought to us by the House uh, with the uh, Commissioner of Human Rights in the Minnesota State Council on Disability Accessibility. Basically, it, it helps clarify the definition of service animal in alignment with the American of Disabilities Act, which relates to it, defines it as a service dog. There are no amendments to the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate File 1086. Third reading. Representative Myra. Mr. Speaker, uh, will Representative Dorholt yield to a question? He will. Representative Myra. Representative Dorholt, I was reading your bill and looking at the added language that you have in here. I was curious about the definition of service animals, and I tried to find the definition uh, in the... Americans with Disabilities Act, Code of Federal Regulations, Title 111, Part 35, Section 36.104, and I couldn't find it. Uh, could you help me with that, please? Representative Dorholt. Absolutely. Thank you, Representative Myra. It is, uh, service animals are defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Um, that is the 
the brief description, and it goes on to say, examples of such work or tasks include guiding people who are blind, alerting people who are deaf, pulling a wheelchair, alerting and protecting a person who is having a seizure, reminding a person with mental illness to take prescribed medications, calming a person with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, during an anxiety attack, or performing other duties. Service animals are working animals, not pets. The work or task a dog has been trained to provide must be directly related to the person's disability. Dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. This definition does not affect or limit the broader definition of assistance animal under the Fair Housing Act or the broader definition of service animal under the Air Carrier Access Act. Representative Myra. Represent Mr. Speaker, Representative Dorholt, thank you for that. I appreciate the clarification. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Dorholt yield? He will yield. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Dorholt. I, I certainly appreciate your, your explanation, your clarification. I just, with something you said at the very end, I, I just want to be clear. Uh, can this uh, apply to other animals? For example, I, I heard uh, the, the possibility of, of miniature horses or ponies being used and such. Uh, would this apply to them? Would it, could it apply to other animals? Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, no, the American with Disabilities Act defines a service animal as a dog. Representative Erickson. Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and would the author yield for a question? He will. Representative Thank Erickson. you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Dorholt, uh, why will there not be an identification anymore that shows anyone who is present in a place in which a disabled person comes with his or her dog not have to be in place? Uh, I would think that would be rather confusing to perhaps the, the customers in a restaurant, let's say. So why the removal of that identification? Representative Dorholt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative. Uh, over the past couple of years, there's been noted cases of discrimination where they aren't allowed. They, even with the vague description of what a service animal is under Minnesota state law, people weren't adhering to it. Uh, bottom line is if you're blind and you want to pull out that identification, how, how does that happen? Um, this is pretty much eliminating d discrimination um, in that the cases where they've had to have this specific identification has shown to be counterproductive in other states. So this is something the Human Rights Council um, and especially the State Council on Disability Accessibility uh, has worked very hard and are very passionate about uh, getting rid of such a, something that actually creates more complications. Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. But I would think that uh, this would be an honor to have this uh, whatever it is, a tag or whatever, to show that this dog is specially trained and that this person is using this dog as a seeing eye dog or for some other reason. So, you know, I don't know if the Human Rights Commission is right on this one, members. Of course I'm going to support this bill because this is important. But I think this is an issue that we need to give more thought to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Dorhild yield? He will yield. Representative Pepin. Representative Dorholt, maybe you can just walk me through this. How would a restaurant owner know whether or not the uh, dog is a service dog? Representative Dorholt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, well, it, most people who have a service animal will have some kind of label. Uh, you often see uh, uh, folks with uh, vision impairment who have a sign on their animal, their service dog, that says, please do not pet. This is a service animal. It is, is very apparent. Um, and this the, part of the reason they wanted to leave this be for the, the time being is the integration of service animals uh, for folks with, with PTSD. Um, they're, not, they're not going to bring those service animals into a restaurant for those type of cases. Um, in a vast majority of cases, the dog is going to be properly identified. Uh, because they don't want the general public, uh, you know, petting their animals or, you know, giving it treats or that sort of thing. So these are, I mean, more than human's best friend, these are 
true assistance to people with disabilities, and they go through uh, major lengths to make sure their dog is, you know, is a service animal. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a par point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, um, is, it, is it proper to ask the, another member to yield to a question, or is, is, has the procedure switched since, uh, since yesterday, a custom and usage in the House, based on your tweets from yesterday? I'm wondering if it is proper to ask another member to yield, or if, since I know the answer to the question, should, shall I just ask the question, and then you will ask the other member to yield, if you could just clarify what the proper procedure is. No, it's proper to ask the member to yield. In fact, I hope people actually ask them to yield instead of just asking the question because it should come to the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for clarifying. That's very confusing because your tweet yesterday said you didn't know why people asked to yield when you, they already knew the answer to that. So that was a confusing uh, tweet while you were at your rostrum. But um, well, I guess then will Representative Dorhold continue to yield? He'll yield for a question. Representative Pepin. Thank you. Um, Representative Dorhold, if someone comes in because it, it's, it's apparently there's no requirement that there be any identification. They should have one probably, or they, they probably likely will. But if someone were to come into a restaurant and they said, you know, my dog is a service dog, and maybe it was just somebody who really wasn't disabled and just wanted to bring their dog to a, a restaurant, then what would happen? What would the restaurant owner do then if he or she thought or the store owner thought that that really wasn't a service dog? What, what would they, that what would be the proper behavior? Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, being part owner of a restaurant, I don't see that as being a problem. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, maybe a rare case, it could. Yes, I, I, and you know, putting forward an animal that's not a service animal is is pretty much not legal. So I can't imagine that happening. And Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Dorhold continue to yield? He'll yield. Yep, Representative Pepin. Thank you, um, Representative Dorhold. Why? Well, I, I know it's not it's not um, good behavior to bring a, a dog in when one isn't allowed, but I'm just suggesting that that could possibly happen if someone were to bring in a dog. And let's say let's say I owned a restaurant and I could tell or I felt that the dog was not a service dog; it was just someone bringing their pet into a restaurant. And then I said. No, I don't want. I don't want you to bring the dog in. There's no dogs allowed in here. What then would be the the penalty for the the restaurant or the store owner for refusing the dog or probably or acting in bad or good faith, but just you know not being clear whether or not the dog was actually a service dog. Representative Dorholt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, yes, it's possible, uh, but not likely. Representative Pepin. Mr. Speaker, um, would Representative Dorhold continue to yield for question? He will. Representative Dor uh, Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Dorhold. What would be the penalty then if for the owner, whether or not it was a service dog, if I'm a restaurant owner and I thought someone was just bringing their pet in, turns out it really was a service dog, what would then be the punishment? Representative Dorhold. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative, I'm unaware of the exact penalties at this time. Um, I mean, we are looking into it uh, as we speak. So. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative uh, Dorheld yield to uh, another question? He will. Representative Pepin. Thank you, um, Representative Dorhold. I'm, I'm wondering if we can just hold off a little bit. I would, before I vote on I would like to know uh, what penalty this uh, would be. I, th I believe it's probably a misdemeanor if it's not specified, but I'd like that to be clarified what the dollar penalty is and, and what the crime would be. All right, is there any other discussion while we wait for that answer? Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Dorholt yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Dorholt. In your bill, I'm looking at lines 1.11 and 1.12, and stricken from the um, previous language you have, if the service animal can be properly identified as being from a recognized program which trains service animals. And what I take that to mean, if I'm just reading this, I think of uh, if I'm going to Minneapolis Airport and I see somebody uh, walking with a service dog, they've got a little thing that says, don't pet me on the dog. 
Is that what the identification that you're talking about that we're no longer requiring? Is it the identification on the dog or does the person carry an identification representative Dorholt? Representative Dorholt. Well, we're, uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative, we're, we're asking for this to be removed because of cases upon cases of discrimination where people have brought dogs in. People don't believe that they're service animals, whether they have that or not. Um, and it hasn't prevented anybody from telling somebody, you, you have to leave this park. Uh, for those of you who are in the committee, a uh, person who is visually impaired would be in a park, and they say, sorry, there's no dogs allowed and they try to make him leave even when he did have that identification. So this is giving over um, simply discrimination against those who need these animals to function well in our society. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Dur Durholt, I, I don't know. Uh, I was just wondering whether the identification that we're asking to be removed from law is the identification on the dog or if the person who is disabled has special identification. I don't know which it is, and I think it's kind of uh, important uh, to understand that before, uh, before moving on because we're asking to remove that identification, whether it's the little windbreaker that the uh, golden retriever has on or if it's a, if it's a uh, identification that the person has to have, whichever we're, we're asked to be removed. Somebody's just reading the bill, I don't really understand which. But you said that most of these dogs are currently identified anyway, which leads me to believe that it might be an identification that the person would carry. Uh, so if you could clarify that. And then also, you said, I think it's, you, you said that it's illegal uh, currently to misrepresent your dog who is currently not a, uh, let's say, a seeing eye dog, uh, a companion animal or whatever the legal term is, uh, for a regular dog. So. If Representative Zellers were to bring Garski into uh, Cafe Latte and say that it is a seeing eye dog, uh, would that in fact be breaking the law? Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative. Well, that's not part of the bill, but also uh, I'm, it may be. I like sort of looking into it. Uh, the, the identification that anybody who has an actual service animal will have is usually a certification of the training that that animal went through. And a vast majority of folks who have a service animal will carry that card on them. Um, accessing that card with certain disabilities has been shown to be a problem in numerous places. So the authorities can ask a general manager of the park it's caused a lot of problems here in Minnesota. Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And if Representative Dorkolt would, would uh, yield for a question, I just wanted to follow up on Representative Erdahl's uh, question about miniature horses because I was looking at the ADA, uh, and it does say miniature horses in there are considered service animals. I just want to clarify whether or not miniature horses would be subject to this or not. Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative. That's actually separate. Uh, that's a separate certification for the miniature horses. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would Representative Dorholt uh, serve for question? He will. Representative Albright. Representative Dorholt, uh, it talks about a recognized program which trains service animals. Are there specific uh, training organizations that receive, and I'll use the expression, the, the good housekeeping service, you know, seal of approval where others don't? And if that's the case, is law enforcement and uh, restaurant and hospitality owners, are they responsible for identifying which uh, recognized training programs are approved and not approved? Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, we're taking that, 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 that part is actually being taken out of this language from recognized program. So once again, this is for the purposes of defining a service animal to line it up with the same definition as the American Disabilities Association, the ADA Act, defines. 
Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Dorholt uh, answer a question? He will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Dorholt, uh, is there a Senate companion bill, and does the language in that bill uh, correspond to the House bill? I'm sorry. I'll re Representative I'll Dorholt. From that. Uh, my, my hearing, I'm suffering a junior moment. Um, so the card itself is is issued by whom? Who issues the card? Is it the service organization? Is it standardized? Representative Dorholt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative, that the people train the dog would have to be approved by the ADA, state or local governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations. Representative Pepin, did you want your question answered? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Representative Dorhold, did you did you find out the answer to what kind of um, penalty the store owner would or restaurant owner would would have if he were to violate this in section in good faith? Representative Dorhold. Mr. Speaker, Representative, the penalty is an, is as you uh, suggested is a misdemeanor. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Dorhold, is there also a fine with the, the misdemeanor penalty or any potential jail time or anything like that? Representative Dorhold will yield. Representative Dorhold. It, uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative, include the standard penalty for a misdemeanor. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 131 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 283. The clerk will report the bill. House File 283, number three on the calendar for the day, the first engrossment, an act relating to evidence. Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, House File 283 includes in the list of uh, mediation or um, uh, conflict negotiation actions that are subject to the privilege against um, or the inadmissibility of evidence from uh, settlement discussions. And uh, it, it's quite simple. It comes from the uh, Uniform Laws Commission. But I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions that Representatives Myra, Erdahl, Erickson, Pepin, Dean, Woodard, Albright, and Pepin again might have on this bill. There's no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 283. Third reading. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 117 uh, uh, ayes and 14 nays, the bill is passed and is title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 369. The clerk will report the bill. House File 369, number four on the calendar for the day, an act relating to community property. Representative Freiberg. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House File 369 is the Uniform Disposition of Community Property Rights at Death Act. As this title might suggest, this is a bill recommended by the Uniform Law Commission. The bill would make it clear what happens to marital property acquired in a community property state when a couple moves to Minnesota, which is a common law property state, and one spouse passes away. Basically, in common law property states like Minnesota, if you have title in property, you keep it when you get married. In community property states, each spouse gains a 50% interest in property when they get married. There are 10 community property states, including Wisconsin, right next door to us. This this legislation is more pressing than previously because Wisconsin only recently adopted that community property system, and as everybody knows here, there's quite a bit of traffic between the two states. In the absence of a law like this, it is uncertain in Minnesota what happens to marital property acquired in a community property state after one spouse dies. The only way this uncertainty could be resolved is by litigation, so this legislation will help reduce litigation. This act makes it clear that property acquired in a community property state remains community property after one spouse dies unless they decide not to keep it in that form. The bill has bipartisan support, is supported by the Bar Association, and has been adopted in 14 states. It was heard in the Civil Law and Judiciary Committees, and it was not controversial in either committee. I would urge a green vote. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 369. Third reading. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would um, Representative uh, Freiberg yield for um, a few questions? He will yield. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, I'm wondering, um, Representative Freiberg, what problems have occurred in Minnesota that require this legislation to happen right now? Have, you, have, you, have we seen an uptick in problems um, regarding this? Representative Freiberg. Thank you, Representative Scott, for the question. As I mentioned, um, Wisconsin only recently switched to a community property system, and because there is so much traffic between the two states, um, the need for this has increased. Community property does have certain advantages, such as capital gains, tax advantages. So uh, if in the event one of the, one part, one partner in a marriage passes away, uh, they might desire to keep that, but a lot of attorneys aren't familiar with the rules of moving from one state to the, to the next, so there's a p potential for a malpractice suit. Those are just a few of the problems this uh, legislation would address. Representative Scott. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Would um, Representative Freiberg yield to another question? He will. Representative Scott. Thank you. Well, Representative Freiberg, how recently did Wisconsin pass their version of this bill? Representative Freiberg. Uh, I don't have the date exactly here. I believe it was it was it was it was maybe 20 years ago. Representative Scott. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Well, it was 26 years ago, and I don't know. In my book, that's not real recent. But um, I'm just wondering, um, was a fiscal note ever requested on this bill? Uh, uh, if, if Representative Freiberg would yield. He will yield. Representative Freiberg. No, it was not. There is no fiscal impact. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just curious, what happens if the piece of prop, if any given property is um, willed to a third party? Would this law affect that? If Representative Freiberg would yield. He will yield. Representative Freiberg. Uh, it would not affect that. Uh, either party to the marriage is still permitted to uh, dispose of the property in any way they wish. Um, so if they decide to will it to a third party, uh, then there's no effect. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Freiberg continue to yield? He will. Representative Scott. Thank you. And Representative Freiberg, um, what would happen, happen if the surviving spouse were to remarry? Would this affect that situation at all? Representative Freiberg. Uh, they would still remain, retain their 50% interest. Um, if they remarried, there might, there might be a distinction depending on whether they remarried. I, I, I'm assuming from, maybe from your question that they would remarry in Minnesota. Um, in which case uh, it would be treated as common law property because Minnesota is a common law property state. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative uh, Freiber continue to yield? He thank will. Representative you. Scott. Thank you. And I'm just curious in Section 8, it talks about um, severability. And I'm wondering if, there, um, if you know of some examples of limitations imposed by law um, preventing um, a disposition there. Representative Freiberg. Uh, Representative Scott, I'm sure there are several. Um, one possibility that leaps to mind is maybe the property is held in trust. Representative Scott. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just curious, too, um, you know, I'm a proponent of joint physical custody and, and uh, shared parenting, and I'm wondering if this would support legal custody um, in any way. Representative Freiberg. Uh, 
I do not know the answer to that question. I, I know that the custody issue is one, one that's been discussed here. This bill would have no impact on that, so it's not an issue I've researched in relation to this bill. Representative Scott. Well, thank you. And um, another question would, um, if, if I might, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. He will yield. Representative uh, Scott. Representative um, Freiberg, would, would rental or lease agreements be impacted by this bill? Representative Freiberg. Uh, no, if property was acquired in uh, at the community property state, uh, I'm sorry, or if it was acquired in Minnesota in a common law property state using rents from the community property state, uh, then the bill would apply here because it's treated as if it was acquired as community property. Um, so. Any further discussion to the bill? Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Freiberg yield to some questions? He will uh, yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Representative Freiberg. I'm looking at the bill and I'm, I'm trying to understand the sections. Um, in section one, section, section one, part two, line 1.15, and then in section one point, section two, line 1.22, they kind of seem to con contradict each other. Um, the first one says all of the, all of the proportional part of any real property situated in Minnesota which was acquired with the rents and others uh, it applies to. And then it, the, other, the second part talks about rebuttable presumptions, and it talks about property acquired during marriage by a spouse of that marriage while domiciled in a, in a different jurisdiction. Could you walk me through those two sections and maybe kind of explain what that, that means? Representative Freiberg. Uh, the first rebuttal, again, these are rebuttable presumptions. So um, as I mentioned earlier, it's possible for the parties to the, for the married parties to the marriage, I guess I'll just say, um, to, uh, to change the nature of the property if they so desire. The first presumption uh, says that uh, the law, this uh, Community Disposition of Property Act, is assumed to apply to marital property acquired while domiciled in the community property state. The second presumption is just when the law is presumed not to apply, and that's to real property located in Minnesota, uh, but also per personal property acquired in the common law state. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, actually, Representative Freiberg, it was in the application section. It talked about this chapter applies to the disposition of death, and I was talking about the section number two in there uh, that starts on line 1.15, and then the part that starts on 1.22, because the first part talks about all of the proportional part of any real property situated in Minnesota, which was acquired with the rents from the other property, and then the rebuttable presumption part talks about property acquired during marriage by a spouse of that marriage while domiciled in a different jurisdiction. And I'm trying to kind of understand that. It looks like the, the application, um, it looks like the first part talks about uh, any real property situated in Minnesota that paid, was paid for with the rents um, from another place. So if you, were in, if you were, lived in Arizona and then you sold your property in Arizona and moved to Minnesota because you bought the property originally in Arizona, would then your property be community property in Minnesota, your home, or any other property? Is that correct? Representative Freiberg. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. I thought you were asking for the distinction between the two presumptions. Um, basically, the part of the application which you cited, starting on line 1.15, uh, says that uh, says that the chapter applies at the, disposition, at the disposition of death to any real property um, in Minnesota acquired with the rents uh, from, from property acquired as community property, such as in Arizona that you mentioned. The first presumption, uh, again, this is only a presumption, so the parties to the marriage can, uh, can decide not to follow that. Um, it just says that the law is assumed to apply to marital property um, acquired while domiciled in the community property state. So the first part you mentioned, um, they could, uh, it's, it could be in Minnesota, um, but it's just acquired with the rents of the community property state. This, the presumption relates to property um, actually situated in the community property state. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Freiburg, would Representative Freiburg continue to yield? He will. Representative Pepin. Thank you. I, I find this bill to be um, somewhat confusing, and it looks like it's real and personal property. So if I were... If, I'm trying to figure out if I do I have to have a, I have to be domiciled in another, another state. And I'll just use Arizona as an example because I know that they're one of the community property states. So if I live in Arizona and with my husband and we have a home there and we decide to retire to the great state of Minnesota, then that property would be community property, I believe. But then am I correct in saying that if we also had a lake home in Minnesota, then that property would be the uh, that would be um, part of the common law. That would be. Um, 
probate under the common law. Is that correct? Representative Freiberg. Yes. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Freiberg. So that part seems a little confusing to me because then you'd have part of your probate that was part of your estate that was um, probate under community property and part that was probate under common law property, and and then it looks like it, since it's also real or it's also personal property, not real property. So if I were to using the same example, if I were to live in Arizona and acquire a piece of art or something like that with my husband, and then I move back to, to Minnesota, then the presumption that with that as well would be that it would be uh, community property. But then again, if I bought another piece of art from my home, but that art was acquired in Minnesota, a common law property state, then you would have a piece, one piece of art that was community property, and you'd have another piece of art that was common law property. Is that accurate? Representative Pepin, or Representative Freiberg. Sure. Um, if you look to uh, line 1.9 of the bill, it applies to all personal property that was acquired um, and remained community property under the laws of a jurisdiction. So the art you mentioned, if acquired in Arizona, would be treated as community property. Uh, you know, it's, I suppose it's potentially confusing, but I have confidence in our probate system that they will be able to work through this issue. As I mentioned, there are advantages to community property. If it's a valuable enough piece of art, uh, the married couple might prefer to keep that as much of it as possible uh, as community property. But if they don't want to, they have the ability to sever the community property nature of it. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Freiberg continue to yield? He will. Representative Pepin. Thank you. Representative Freiberg, I think one of the first comments you made was that this was going to um, make the process easier and, and um, have less litigation. And um, I'm not an expert in this area of law. I don't practice probate. Um, I don't believe you practice probate. I'm not an attorney. You're, I, I know that you have a law degree. Um, I'm wondering, I guess, a couple questions. First of all, how do you think, that, because based on that, the example I just gave, how do you believe that this is going to make the probate process easier? And then second of all, I, um, have you spoken to any private, I know that you said the ABA supports it, have you spoken to any lawyers that practice in the area of this area of law to find out what, what they feel about this legislation? Representative Freiberg. Uh, to answer your second question, yes, I've spoken Mr. Speaker, to point a of parliamentary inquiry. Sorry, I was getting some feedback or something. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, under House Rule 2.20, is it appropriate for members to address the speaker first before addressing other members of the entire body? Representative Sanders, yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please remind the body, all members on both sides of the aisle, that when being recognized by the speaker, to first go through the speaker before addressing the members or the body. I think everybody heard you, Representative Sanders. Representative Freiberg, you can answer the question. Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Speaker, if you could please request that Representative Pepin repeat the question. There were two questions. Thank you. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Freiberg. Well, it was so long ago, I, I now forget part of it. But I, I guess my overall question, the two questions I had were, um, are you, you, you thought that this was going to make probate easier, that it was going to uh, lessen litigation. But the example I used about, you know, if you, bought, had a, if you were domiciled, you had a place in Arizona, and then you bought a place in Minnesota, and then versus if you're, then you, then you're domiciled in Minnesota, you have a lake place in Minnesota, now you've got community property, and you've got common law property. And the same with art, the artwork example I gave. You buy a piece of artwork in Arizona, it's not community property. And I'm not talking a, you know, $25 piece, I'm talking about a, maybe it might be a $1,000 piece of artwork, or $10,000 piece of artwork, and then you, the same thing here. I'm trying to understand how that would make probate easier. To me, that seems like it would make it a lot more probate. So my first question was, how do you view that, based on my examples, how do you view, view that this would make the probate process go easier and quicker? And then my second question is, have you had a chance to talk to uh, a, a private attorneys that practice in probate law, and how many, and what feedback you've gotten from them? Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill provides a framework that attorneys uh, can use. It does make it clearer, uh, you know, what happens to the property. Um, as I mentioned, 
there are, there are benefits to community property that married couples might like to take advantage of, and if they don't receive those benefits, they're um, because of advice of, of an attorney, many of whom aren't uh, familiar with this, area, with this area of law and exactly what happens under these circumstances, and that'll get to your second question in just a minute. But if they don't receive the advantages that they feel they were entitled to because of the benefits of community property, there's the potential of malpractice lawsuits against the attorneys who represented them in this case. Um, and the uh, parties to the marriage do have the opportunity uh, not to do that, and there are additional protections in here and they don't, in that they don't have the, an obligation to check the status of the property. Um, your second question was whether or not I've spoken to uh, probate attorneys, and the answer is yes. The attorneys from the Bar Association uh, who requested this bill practice in this area and believe that it would make uh, the administration of probate in Minnesota uh, considerably more smooth and streamline the process. Uh, I believe there were two or three attorneys I spoke to. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Court Freiberg. Well, I don't ask any more questions, and um, I, I guess I'm kind of torn on this bill. I'm not sure. It, to me, it looks like it would make probate a lot more difficult because you're kind of commingling community property and then common law property law uh, might make some make they might like the uh, legislation because it might provide for more work for for probate lawyers so I guess I'm not really surprised that they like this bill uh, I'm as of now I'm still uncertain as to how I'm going to vote because I'm, I'm I'm not I'm unclear of some of the details of the couple of sections I mentioned and I'm not clear yet how this would make litigation or the probate process go smoother. So thank you for the presentation and I'll give it some more thought here. Representative Kowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the author would yield. He will yield. Representative Kowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Freiburg, um, can you can you walk through uh, section four for us, the uh, section that deals with the per perfection of title of a surviving spouse and kind of just tell us um, what it means and how it works. It's kind of a complicated section. Resident Freiburg. I, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm flattered by all the attention this bill is receiving. It, uh, other members of the House must think it's as great a bill as I do. Um, Section 4 provides that if any of the property which is uh, titled in the deceased spouse's name is property subject to the Act, the surviving spouse's uh, title may be perfected by court order or by deed from the deceased spouse's personal representative, trustee, or successors in trust with approval of the court. Um, it further provides uh, that the personal representative or the trustee has no duty to discover or attempt to discover if any property titled in the deceased spouse's name is property subject to the act, and this is the provision I mentioned in response to one of Representative Pepin's question, um, unless the surviving spouse makes a written demand pursuant to guidelines which are set forth in this section. Um, it's designed to eliminate any liability of the person representative or the trustee for a breach of their fiduciary duty by failing to search for or discover whether property held by the decedent is property subject to the act. Representative Druskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Freiberg. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 132 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. There's another bill uh, on uh, the next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 450. The clerk will report the bill. House File 450 uh, on the calendar for the day, the first engrossment. An act relating to civil action. Representative Atkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, on behalf of my mom, I want to thank all of the members on the other side of the aisle for all of the questions. She was afraid that she might not be home from luncheon time today in order to see me make the, my appearance on the House floor with this highly important bill, uh, which it really is. On behalf of Minnesota's architects and engineers, uh, as well as Representative Fitzsimmons and I and a bipartisan set of authors, uh, uh, this bill is uh, fairly straightforward. It fixes an error uh, as a result of some legislation that passed in 2007, the result of which 
was that we opened up uh, architects and engineers to unlimited contribution and indemnity claims in improvement to real property cases for eternity. Uh, and that's kind of a problem because that means for an architect or engineer, um, we intended to have it be 14 years when we passed the law. When it goes to eternity, that means that architects and engineers aren't exactly allowed to retire, ever because the way that they get their insurance is it only uh, continues to work as long as they're in practice. Uh, so as a result, um, by having uh, unlimited contribution and indemnity claims, uh, many of them aren't able to retire. It was certainly not an intent intended consequence of the law that was passed in 2007. Uh, so on behalf of the architects and engineers here in Minnesota, we'd appreciate your support. It limits contribution and indemnity claims to no later than 14 years from when the construction took place. And with that, I'd appreciate uh, members' support for the bill. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 450. Third reading, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would uh, Representative Atkins yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Hurtas. Uh, I'm just curious with regard to the assertion of uh, allowing people to retire. Would that uh, suggest to you, to one then, that uh, it would be necessary to carry insurance for 14 years after you actually do retire? Representative Atkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Hurtas. I guess I'd ask the engineers, I just am, am basing that on what their testimony was in committee representative, uh, and they indicated that they need to keep their policy in place until the possible uh, potential claim. So if, if I was, uh, and I have my own uh, pr uh, insurance uh, for the practice of law, uh, I would keep that in place until all possible claims have expired. Uh, in a case like this, that's conceivable that they'd want to keep it until the very end of whatever that period is for which a claim might be presented. Representative Hurtas. Thank you. It would appear that contractors should retire when they're 50. Thank you. Representative Zellers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And would the author of the bill yield for a question? He will. Representative Zellers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Atkins, you. Uh, said during your presentation that you have uh, the support of these groups and I was wondering uh, if you could on behalf, because we would want you to be honest on the floor in front of your mother, uh, what of these are associations approved and uh, what their qualifications are as an organization? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zellers, heck if I know. Um, I've just been told that uh, we've got the architects group, the engineers group, uh, are both in support of it. Um, I'm not aware of any opposition. I believe the Insurance Federation is neutral. Uh, the trial lawyers haven't taken a position on it. Uh, and all it does is limit uh, potential liabilities so that they don't last forever. Representative Zellers. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Atkins. And we will we'll take your word for it on that. And the trial lawyers being neutral actually does help for the vote. So thank you for the legislation and happy that your mom was able to catch you before afternoon tea. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 131 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, Murphy E. for the Committee on Rules, pursuant to Rule 121 and 333, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for today for Thursday, April 18, 2013. House File 976. Motions and resolutions. Copies of the non-controversial resolutions are at the desk and online. If there's no objection to those motions, we'll take them first. Hearing no objection, those motions prevail. Any announcements? Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative uh, Murphy yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Doubt. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Murphy. Uh, in today's bill introductions, I see that House File 1783 uh, appears to be a, a bill on capital investment. Is there a reason that's being referred to the Rules Committee and not to the Capital Investment Committee? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Doubt, I am told it is the governor's uh, bill on uh, capital improvement. Okay. Thank you. Any other announcements? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 9 a.m. Wednesday, April 17, 2013. Representative Murphy moves that when the House adjourn today, it adjourn until 9 a.m. Wednesday, April 17, 2013. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. no. The motion prevails. Representative Murphy. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Murphy moves that the House do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Yay. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. Wednesday, April 17, 2013.